uh, Dr. Burchill uh, at Oregon Health Sciences. But I think there's some key factors here, uh, which is that the pain should be in the trigeminal nerve distribution, so V1, V2, or V3. Uh, they are proxismal attacks, so intermittent attacks that can last seconds up to minutes. Uh, and it should be an intense or sharp stabbing pain, and it should be precipitated by a trigger. And the trigger can be anything from uh, touching the face to winds to eating, chewing, drinking, um, sometimes just positional changes. Uh, and they are very stereotyped. So when someone comes in and says the pattern is different every time, it makes you think that it might not be trigeminal neuralgia. The biggest difference between type one and type two is that with type one, the majority of the time there is pain-free intervening episodes. So you can ask a patient with trigeminal neuralgia type one, and they'll say that most of the time they don't have pain, but when the pain comes, it's a deadly pain. Trigeminal neuralgia type two, on the other hand, there's a persistent pain underlying it where they have pain more than 50% of the time. And secondary trigeminal neuralgia is when it's caused by another structural lesion. So again, going into the history that's relevant, uh, I have a, a, almost a checklist in my mind as I speak to patients. I really wanna know the location. So I ask them where the pain is. This is they'll just point to their entire face and I'll say, no, 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 no. I need you to tell me exactly where your pain is uh, because I wanna understand your pain. The next part is very hard to elicit. Um, and the harder it is to elicit, the less likely it probably is to be trigeminal neuralgia, but the quality of the pain. I'm looking for them to call it stabbing or electrical or stunning or something where it sounds like a, a shock, something that is you know just coming out of nowhere and just grasps them from uh, out of uh, from a pain-free episode. It's in contrast to a burning, gnawing, chronic, aching pain. That's not the type of pain I want to hear about with trigeminal neuralgia. Now, to be honest, in type two, you can have both. You can have that chronic, burning, gnawing pain underlying it with this overlying stabbing electrical trigger type pain. So again, the timing and triggers become an important factor, which is uh, you know, we wanna have those intermittent pain-free episodes. Now, something that um, I haven't really seen in a textbook, but it's a rule that I use, um, which I find to be a good differentiator of trigeminal neuralgia from other types of facial pain, which is whether the patients are afraid of their pain. And what I mean by that is, do they feel like it can attack them out of nowhere and cripple them? Is it, are they afraid to eat? Are they afraid to even move because the pain is suddenly going to grip them? Or is it a more chronic pain that's just always there and it just ruins their life? The patients who say they're afraid of their pain, in my experience, have, are more likely to have trigeminal neuralgia because it sort of signifies that stabbing, electrical, shocking, intermittent, triggered type pain. So for me, if someone says they're not afraid of their pain, they just are devastated by it, that's uh, a red flag. Now, speaking of red flags, uh, we not only wanna know about the distribution of the pain, the pattern of the pain, the triggers, whether they're afraid of it, but we wanna know about other symptoms that may make us think about other types of facial pain. In particular, I always document whether patients have autonomic symptoms. And in particular, I talk about watering eye, whether they have conjunctival uh, injections or redness of the eye, tearing of the eye, runny nose, swelling of the face, discoloration of the face associated with the pain. A lot of people say, yes, I cry when I have the pain, but I say, no, 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 no. Not, I'm not asking if you're crying out of pain, but do you get these symptoms when you have the pain? And if you do, or if the patient has that, it should be a red flag that we're not treating trigeminal neuralgia or any variant of trigeminal neuralgia. It's actually an autonomic cephalalgia, the most popular of which is cluster headache. And cluster headache, if you haven't seen it, can be very similar to trigeminal neuralgia. So you really want to differentiate it. And the response, uh, the treatment is gonna be very different for cluster headache versus, or any autonomic cephalalgia versus uh, trigeminal neuralgia. So it's important to get that. Seasonal variations, again, this is the classic definition of what a cluster headache is, that it clusters at a certain time of year, that you get a lot of attacks, you have pain-free weeks or months at a time. Um, and then any other visual or neur uh, neurological phenomenon, 
uh, which may indicate a migrainous type of pain rather than a trigeminal neuralgia type pain. Now, medical therapy, there is not a patient that I'm going to treat surgically or consider for any kind of surgical intervention who hasn't had a first line medication, which generally is carbamazepine or oxcarbazepine. And it's important to do that because it's a good diagnostic tool as well. Patients with trigeminal neuralgia generally respond to carbamazepine. Uh, if they took a maximum dose of carbamazepine and they never responded to it, it's not a red flag, but it should give you pause and have you reevaluate whether or not they have trigeminal neuralgia or oxcarbazepine. Sometimes though, some people have so much side effect or they are so intolerant of the medication that you never get a good sign. Other medications that people are often on are baclofen, gabapentin, pregabalin, or, or Cymbalta, or any of the other uh, antidepressants that uh, could help with the pain. Lots of different medication variations. But again, I like to know that they've been on either carbamazepine or oxcarbazepine and know what their response is to that before I proceed with surgical treatment. The last thing is before I approach someone with uh, any kind of surgical treatment, I want to do an MRI. And it's a very commonly misunderstood factor that people will say, we're looking for a vascular loop on the MRI. And with improved imaging, we can see vascular loops, we can see veins, particularly focusing on, on the root entry zone. But that's not the point of the MRI. I will consider a microvascular decompression on someone who doesn't have evidence of a vascular loop. What we're really looking for are other things that could be causing the pain. So it could be you know, a mass lesion, which could be a tumor of the trigeminal nerve. You could have a cancer that's spread along the nerve that can cause pain. You could have multiple sclerosis, which is what's imaged here. You can see uh, as the trigeminal nerve enters the uh, brainstem that there's discoloration from demyelination and that's resulting in uh, trigeminal neuralgia. So the key point here is imaging should be necessary, but it should not be to confirm neurovascular conflict, but to evaluate for secondary causes because your approach, again, may be very different with secondary causes of trigeminal neuralgia. Now, assuming we've gotten through all that, so we've done a history, we have established that the patient has trigeminal neuralgia or has trigeminal neuralgia-like symptoms that could respond to our surgical interventions, um, we then talk about surgical treatments. And I, in my mind, group them into three categories. There's the microvascular decompression, which I'm sure you've heard about, which is um, a favorite surgery of uh, surgeons because the anatomy is uh, beautiful. It's very satisfying. Um, it has risks though, it's invasive. Then we have percutaneous treatments where we put a needle through the face uh, to either uh, ablate the nerve with glycerol or with a balloon, which we can inflate to compress the nerve, or um, we can use radio frequency uh, to target a specific part of the ganglion. Finally, we can do stereotactic radio surgery. It's the least invasive of the procedures, but the least effective of the procedures. And I'm going to talk about this, uh, talk about the outcomes for that as well. I do want to highlight this slide because I speak with every single one of my patients about all of these treatments before I recommend one treatment or the other. Because patients have different tolerance. So uh, I want to highlight that Sometimes we say young patients should always have a microvascular decompression, but people have different home situations, work situations. Some people have different risk tolerance. And frankly, to, to jump ahead a little bit, stereotactic rate of surgery is maybe 70% effective, whereas MVD might be 95% effective initially. And MVD has a lower recurrence rate than stereotactic rate of surgery, but Stereotactic radio surgery still works in a number of people. And many people would say, well, I'll still take that. Even if it's not as effective, I'll take the lower probability of uh, benefit because it's perceived to be or it might be safer. So in terms of microvascular decompression, I'm not going to get into the surgical details because I wanted to mostly go ahead to uh, the non-traditional treatments that you probably have heard about less. But in this case, you can see the trigeminal nerve, there's a branch of the superior cerebellar artery. And the goal there is to use micro dissection and a microscope to carefully dissect the uh, arachnoid plane between that uh, artery 
and that trigeminal nerve and move it away from the trigeminal nerve and place a piece of felt or tether that artery away from the nerve. Um, it's still, I think it's important to know that the goal here is not to damage the trigeminal nerve, but there's still a risk of having numbness in the face, just like with radio surgery and with uh, balloon compression or any other percutaneous treatment. In fact, if you look at the Japanese literature, they describe a technique of internal neurolysis or raking the nerve, which is uh, when you take a micro dissector, you actually would separate the fascicles of the trigeminal nerve. And my belief is that it's that micro trauma to the nerve that may in and of itself be the therapeutic mechanism behind microvascular decompression, which is why some people can get better by the surgery without having neurovascular conflict which is also the reason why you don't have to see vascular compression when you approach the surgery uh, or when you choose to do the surgery. Now I wanna switch gears to the percutaneous ablative procedures. These are very, uh, yeah, I think very effective uh, procedures. It does take some skill in terms of knowing how to use an, uh, the C-arm or the fluoroscopy equipment in order to get a sub mental view and visualize the foramen of valley. So all those foramina that you learn in the skull base are actually relevant to our practice. The goal is to place something through the side of the mouth without puncturing the oral cavity, advancing the needle into the foramen of valley, advancing it to a point so you can either place a balloon within Meckel's cave or place an RF needle in a certain part, direct it into a certain part of the uh, ganglion and ablate that region. These percutaneous procedures really could be used for anyone. Um, they are particularly useful for people that need acute pain relief. So if someone is admitted to the hospital with a uh, status trigeminous or tri trigeminal neuralgia crisis, uh, we can use balloon compressions to get that acute pain relief um, because it works very quickly. We often consider as a, if there's a failure of other treatments, I've also used it as a first line treatment once I've discussed the risks and benefits of the various procedures. Um, I also tend to use balloon compressions for multiple sclerosis related trigeminal neuralgia. And the reason why is because if we look at outcomes for the treatment of multiple sclerosis related trigeminal neuralgia across percutaneous procedures, microvascular decompression and radiosurgery, the efficacy is about the same regardless of which technique you use, which means you don't the risks of microvascular decompression do not go away, but the efficacy goes down such that it's just as efficacious as doing a balloon compression or radio surgery. So why expose someone to the risks of an open surgery if you're gonna get the same outcome? And so that's why I've generally tended towards a balloon compression with MS-related trigeminal neuralgia. Again, we can use glycerol, radiofrequency ablation, or balloon compression. Here are some x-rays and they won't project fantastically well, but uh, if you're watching this on a uh, video, you hopefully can pause and take a look. But you know, this is looking straight up through the face as you can see that angle right there. Here's the angle of the mandible. If you look between uh, the mandible and the back molars, there's a little lucency right here, which is the foramen ovale. You can see we've advanced the needle straight into that lucency. We then go to a lateral view. And in the lateral view, you've got the cella, you got the sphenoid, the needle is going right up to the, um, anterior part of the sphenoid. When we inflate the balloon, it fills up Meckel's cave and actually the tip of the balloon becomes deformed and it's filling what we call porous trigeminus. That's where the trigeminal nerve enters Meckel's cave before it splits into the ganglion or the ganglion splits into the three divisions. In my experience, many studies will show that if you get this deformation, you have a higher likelihood of getting pain relief for the patient with trigeminal neuralgia symptoms. Um, this can also cause a significant bradycardia. In fact, it can cause an asystole, which can alarm uh, your anesthesiologist. So you need to let them know ahead of time. Sometimes they'll put, place pacers on the patient. Um, in any case, you need to have, uh, let, that, let the anesthesiologist know so they don't get scared. Uh, in terms of outcomes, and we're gonna look at some relative outcomes, but I, I, you know, balloon compression being one of my Preferred treatments, um, you know, the thought is that it preferentially injures the medium and large myelinated pain fibers. The patient is asleep. These patients are often in a pain crisis and they can't 
really wake up and cooperate with the, the testing for radio frequency ablation. You get preservation of the small myelinated fibers, uh, which is uh, good for maintaining sensory reflexes. Um, and, ref and the initial pain relief you know, is not too far off from what you get with a microvascular decompression. It's about 90% is what I tell my patients with uh, some recurrence, about 20% of patients are gonna have recurrence at three years. Um, some dysesthesia, so anesthesia, to add dysesthesia meaning some uncomfortable numbness, anesthesia dolorosa, true anesthesia dolorosa is extremely rare, uh, but it can happen and I do counsel my patients about it. Glycerol rhizotomy um, is same approach, but instead of, um, instead of uh, using a balloon, you inject some uh, radio opaque solution with high uh, concentration glycerol. And the idea there is to irritate the nerve with the glycerol. It's best for V3 distribution because the glycerol will settle into Meckel's cave, which you can see here. And you can see the dependent fluid level. That's the fluid level. That's the glycerol filling Meckel's cave. Some initial good relief, but the recurrence rate is actually much higher with glycerol. And that's why in my experience, I have not been using glycerol very often. It's also very hard to get pharmacy to forming like that. Um, and finally, there's radio frequency ablation, uh, which uh, I do use, particularly when a patient has a very specific distribution of pain. I prefer not to use it for people with a, a V1 or a pain in their forehead or eye because I don't want to get corneal numbness. My experience is that people get a denser numbness with radio frequency ablation, although it can be very effective. Uh, but you can see that the, effect, the efficacy rates are somewhere between 80 and 95% again, uh, but recurrence rate is fairly high as well. So I use it for targeted treatments. Finally, we'll look at uh, radio surgery. And radio surgery is um, you know, very uh, non-invasive. Um, it's focused radiation at the root entry zone same area that we'd be operating on with an open microvascular decompression. Um, and what you can see is that the probability of sustained relief, there's a high rate of relief in the first six months, um, but there's a high rate of recurrence also. Uh, so if you have an early excellent outcome, you're gonna stay pretty good, but you see about 30% are gonna have a recurrence. You can though, but if you don't have a good relief early on, you're gonna fall off that, uh, map pretty quickly. And so you can, you might need further treatments. We should note, I mean, people can go in any order, right? So you can get radio surgery and then get a balloon compression, a microvascular decompression. You can get a microvascular decompression, then a radio surgery. Although once you have a microvascular decompression, it can be harder to see the transdermal nerve, but no one treatment rules out the next treatment. Radio surgery doses will vary depending on what type of system you use between 80, 85, or 90 gray to the root entry zone and takes somewhere, you know, some people get relief in a few days. I generally tell my patients to wait up to three months, but usually four to six months to get their pain. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.